Hi, this is Andrew Wolf. In this video, I'm going to talk about the pathophysiology of thromboembolic disease, in particular deep vein thrombosis. So here I'm going to draw a vein, and in the vein, the vein is lined with endothelial cells. And then, of course, on the inside of the vein, blood is flowing. Now, in order to understand thromboembolic disease, we need to talk about what prevents clots, what prevents thrombi from forming to begin with. Well, one thing that there's one set of proteins that keep um, thrombi from forming, and that is a set of proteins that is expressed on endothelial cells. One of these pro proteins is prostacyclin, which is a, one of the prostaglandins. Um, and this is expressed as a cell membrane protein on the endothelial cells. Okay, and then another similar protein is called thrombomodulin. thrombomodulin, and then there is another protein, or actually it's a group of, of uh, actually it's not a protein at all, it's a proteoglycan, so it's a combination of peptides and carbohydrate molecules, and these are called heparin proteoglycans. Now we've figured out how to make our own heparins and give them to patients, but they are similar to the chemicals that we have expressed by our endothelial cells. In fact, the um, original, you know, the what's called, um, you know, the medication called heparin is actually derived from from pork. So it's actually gathered from um, the endothelial cells of pigs, and I don't know the process of doing that, but now we figured out how to make synthetic heparins um, in the form of low molecular weight heparins. Low molecular weight heparins. But anyways, they um, they are similar to the uh, chemicals that are expressed on the membranes of endothelial cells. Now, prostacyclin works by blocking platelet aggregation. And thrombomodulin works by um, by preventing, um, I believe it's seven um, factor seven from becoming seven A. So it blocks part of the clotting cascade, and heparin stimulates antithrombin three, and antithrombin three blocks prothrombin from becoming thrombin. Okay, and there's other chemicals um, similar to this that uh, that are active on the endothelial cells, but those are um, sort of represent three um, different ways that these uh, chemicals can work to prevent uh, to prevent clotting formation. Now it's interesting to note that our blood is constantly clotting, forming fibrin strands, and dissolving through plasmin activation. So we're constantly forming little clots and we're constantly starting the um, coagulation cascade and then stopping it somewhere in the middle. So there's always a, sort of this dynamic equilibrium between um, between clotting and clot dissolution. So again, this is a dynamic equilibrium. Now this dynamic equilibrium, remember how we talked early on in the, with the concept of homeostasis, that this dynamic equilibrium depends on the mixing action that occurs in our circulatory system. So this requires constant mixing and remixing. Now remember, um, 
these chemicals that are expressed on the endothelial cells are if the blood is still it's only going to interact with the mic with a micrometer layer you know the, the layer of two of blood right around those uh, protein chemicals so the blood in these layers will not interact with those chemicals so in order for there to be interaction we have to have mixing and matching and that occurs because of blood flow so this is dependent on flow okay now the other thing that it's dependent on is uh, the presence of anticoagulant chemicals in the bloodstream and the other thing that is dependent on is an intact endothelium because once we have a breakdown in endothelial cells then we have exposure of the blood to collagen and we have activation of the uh, coagulation cascade through the both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways okay so these are the three things that need to be in place to prevent clot formation in this dynamic equilibrium these three factors bring us to a discussion of what's called Virchow's triad, which is essentially these three factors in in reverse. Okay, so let me redraw this on another page. So we have Virchow's triad. Now Virchow was a physiologist who lived, uh, you know, a hundred years ago or so, and he proposed that three things need to be in place in order for the formation of a clot to, to occur inside a vein. One is damage to the endothelium or vessel to damage. So an injury to the vessel. Number two is venous stasis. And number three is a hypercoagulable condition. Okay, so that is sort of the flip side of what we just talked about above, where we need flow, we need an intact endothelium. and we need anticoagulation the anticoagulation system in place okay now what's interesting to note and i, and I don't think Virchow ever talked about this but if you have a very hypercoagulable system situation then it's going to sort of fill most of the triangle so you're not going to need a lot of stasis or a lot of damage to the vessel, right? And vice versa, if you have a lot of damage to a vessel, you may not require quite as much of a hypercoagulable system. And if you have a long period of stasis and no flow, you're not going to require as much of a hypercoagulable condition or damage to the vessel. So you kind of get the point. Um, this really depends on what's going on with the patient. So what can cause stasis? Well, um, anything in which you have um, low venous flow for a period of time. So this could be um, decreased mobility, bed rest. And this is what we see in our hospital patients quite frequently. Um, this could be this could be due to another d disease such as congestive heart failure in which you have uh, poor flow back to the heart. Damage to the vessel can take place in a number of forms. Could be due to chemical injury um, from smoking. 
could be due to a physical injury to the lower extremity. And then hypercoagulable conditions, there are many. Um, now we talked about how, uh, how tissue factor can be initiated by inflammation, right? So anything that is a, an inflammatory condition can cause it. So sepsis, um, autoimmune disorders, um, and you know, it could be a, a pneumonia. Um, major surgery. So really, you know, those of you who worked in the hospital realize that just about everybody in the hospital has a reason to have a significant in, um, inflammatory response. And that in itself will make them hypercoagulable. Uh, now, also, we can have genetic or acquired uh, deficiencies in some of the coag anticoagulation factors. So we could have an antithrombin 3 deficiency, uh, protein C or protein S. And then we could have a Hageman factor deficiency. And interestingly enough, Hageman factor is interesting because uh, Hageman factor is factor 12 and it actually initiates the start of the intrinsic um, intrinsic coagulation cascade. However, Hageman factor is also important in uh, it's an important negative feedback chemical that actually stops thrombin formation. So people with Hageman factor tend not to die of bleeding, they tend to die of clotting. So actually, Mr. Hageman himself, whom the disorder was named after because he was the first one that was discovered to have a Hageman factor deficiency, he actually was discovered to have it because he had significant bleeding uh, after, after having surgery. Um, however, he survived the um, bleeding and um, died many years later because he ended up with a DVT and a pulmonary embolus. Okay, so that kind of covers it. Um, now, those of you who are... Uh, have worked in the in the hospital, you're aware that what occurs is you end up with a big clot inside a vessel and it tends to occur most commonly in our lower extremities. Actually it can occur in our upper extremities as well. Uh, however the veins in our lower extremities are much bigger so the uh, emboli, the thrombi that form in our lower extremities are, are a much bigger threat. So if we have uh, thrombi that form in our upper extremities they generally aren't big enough to cause a significant problem. So we end up with a thrombus, it flecks off and floats up, um, and now usually, you know, it floats up to the right side of our heart, and the right side of our heart, here let me make some room here, so the right side of our heart pumps into the pulmonary veins. So we end up with this thrombus that goes up through the inferior vena cava into the right side of our heart and then uh, through the right atrium and the right ventricle and lodges itself in the pulmonary artery. And this is this would be called a saddle horn pulmonary embolus and it would um, cause blood flow into the pulmonary arteries to be diminished um, very significantly. Now, interestingly enough, there are some patients who have a defect in their heart that provides communication between the right-sided circulation and the left-sided circulation. Uh, it may be a patent foramen ovale, for instance, and what happens then is the clot actually travels from the right atrium into the left atrium and down into, from the left atrium into the left ventricle and then it travels up from the aorta and it ends up going, some, sometimes it can end up going up the carotid artery and you end up blocking off the carotid artery or one of the big arteries in the head and you can have a stroke. So I've seen this happen on a couple of occasions where we end up with a person that has had a significant stroke 
we do an echo, which is um, which is one of the tests that we do if a patient has had a stroke, and um, we might find a patent foramen ovale. And if we find a patent foramen ovale, the next step would be to do an ultrasound of the legs, and we may find our source for the stroke. Now, this is a relative, relatively rare occurrence. It is much more common to have a, um, a pulmonary embolus from a deep vein thrombosis that embolizes. Um, in fact, it is theorized that um, the lung sort of acts like a filter for small thrombi, because if you just have a small thrombus that forms down here and it flecks off and embolizes, it's going to embolize way down in a tiny, tiny pulmonary artery um, way in a distal lung and it's not going to cause a huge problem. However, a small emboli that embolizes up into the brain is going to kill off a significant part of the brain and cause a significant stroke. So actually having our lungs work as a filter for small emboli is, is has a evolutionary advantage because it's not causing significant problems. It's a problem that our body can compensate for. It is really only these large emboli that that um, that lodge in significant branches of the pulmonary arteries that cause a significant problem. The very small ones don't cause problems at all, and most people may not even notice them. Okay, so that ends my discussion about um, thromboembolic disease, and please take a moment to. Um, to give me a comment on the video or ask a question um, and rate the video with a like or a dislike. And also, I'm going to put up a link here for you to link to the channel for a quick and easy access to the rest of the videos on uh, the hematologic system. Thank you very much.